Another important consideration is whether or not to include a particular variable as a predictor variable. Right? That is, what are good predictor variables? So the point is, not all good predictor variables are good candidates for inclusion. Now, this might sound like a little paradoxical. Meaning, we are saying, look, this is a really good predictor variable. Why shouldn't I include it in the model? Doesn't make sense to not include it in the model. That's what at least it looks like out at the outset. But let's understand this. Take an example here. Shipping cost. Let's say you're trying to predict the total order amount in some setting. And clearly, you find from your data, you've got historical data on shipping amount and the total order amount. And you find that shipping amount, shipping cost is a really good predictor of total cost, okay, of the total order amount. Should you include it? Well, it doesn't look like a good candidate to include in a predictive model because in a predictive model, what you're trying to do is for future cases, you're trying to predict what the total order amount is going to be for future cases. Right. It's unlikely that for those future cases, you're going to have the shipping cost. If you had it, you would also have the total order amount. You wouldn't need to predict. Right. So there are some predictive variables which would be available in historical data, but which would be unavailable in uh, other future data that you're going to use. So therefore, not all predictive variables are actually good candidates for inclusion. This is a good predictor, but it's not really useful. It might be a good point, good, good point at which to stop and think of examples of other variables which might be good predictors, but not really useful in a predictive model. Now we want to look at another important characteristic, another important property of models, which is how appropriate are models, right? Remember, our process is going to be we partition the data. For now, we'll think of it as training and validation partitions. We build a model with the training partition, and then we apply the model to the validation partition. Okay, so now we are talking about when we are doing the modeling with the training data, how good a model do we look for? Okay, so here, for example, I've taken a simplified example where we are trying to predict sales as a function of advertising. Right. So we've got advertising and we've got sales information. Historically, these are the points that we are seeing here. OK, so it looks like in general, increasing advertising increases sales, but not always. OK, so one thing we might do is to fit a straight line. And say for future, we'll use this straight line to predict sales response to advertising. That's one possibility, but clearly this possibility is not an exact fit for the training data. What you're seeing on the screen is the training data. Clearly, the line is not giving an exact fit. In fact, there's no point on the line, right? So the line does not make an accurate prediction for any of these individual points, but it does a good job overall approximately. But for every single point, the line has an error, right? So it's not a perfect fit, but is it a good model? That's the question. Alternately, we might get another model, which is an absolute perfect fit. You've got all these points. Now you've got a smooth curve that's going through all of these points. A perfect fit. So what do you prefer? Do we prefer that or do we prefer this? Intuitively, it might appear to us that the second one is better because it's giving an exact fit. There's no error for any point. So if you're able to build a model like this, then you'll get exact predictions for all the training data. So should we not go with this? Consider an analogy here. Let's say you're going to make a suit and the tailor is measuring you to make a suit. Let's say you've just had a heavy lunch. You're feeling a little full. So you don't want the tailor to measure you exactly and fit you for what you are at that point in time. OK, because if the tailor does such an exact fit for you at that point in time, you lose a little weight, you gain a little weight and your suit becomes suit doesn't fit you well. OK, 
So there are random factors which are operating during the training data. You don't want all of those random factors to be included in your model. Okay, so you don't want a model that is so perfectly fitting that any slight variations will make the model imperfect, will make the model bad, right? So really, that would be called overfitting. You don't want to get a model from the training data that so perfectly fits the training data because it's not as if every piece of information in the training data is tracking underlying patterns. Most of the data is tracking underlying patterns but there is also some random element, random noise in the training data. So you don't want your model to try and adapt to all the random noise in the model. You want the model uh, to pick up only the real underlying trends and underlying patterns and not be too concerned about random noise. Now what is happening in this particular example is that it's, tr it's tracking everything exactly. So if there's a random noise, the model is already including that as well, which would not apply to the future. The future random noise will look different. It won't look like exactly like this. Okay, so that is what is called overfitting. You're building a model that so closely fits the training data that when you try to apply it to validation data or to real life data, it won't apply at all because it has picked up all the noise in the training data in addition to the underlying patterns. Okay, so that's what we mean by overfitting and that is something we should try to avoid. So when you later on, when you're building models, you'll build a lot of models on the training data and you'll find the model does have errors in the training data. It doesn't perfectly fit the training data, but that's fine. Okay, so there's a trade off here. The more complex our model is, the better fit you can get to past data. Okay. You can always make the model more and more complex and make it fit the training data, which is the past data, exactly like we did here. We built a complex model as opposed to a simple model. Okay, So we made the model more complex and made it fit our training data perfectly. So that's what we are talking about here. The more complex the model, the better fit it provides to past data, but the poorer fit it provides to future data. So there's a trade-off involved here. Right, so performance in the past, good performance in the past might actually lead to poor performance on future data. So there's a balancing. Of course, you don't want to build a really horrible model that comes nowhere close to the training data as well. That would be useless. But again, you don't want to have a model that so exactly matches the training data that it cannot perform well on validation or future data. Let's take another example of overfitting which I call a fitting example. So let's say you're trying to predict the extent of charitable contributions by a bunch of people and you've used income, you've used the family size and you've used their zip code as predictors of the extent or the amount of charitable contributions they'll make. Okay, so those are the three predictor variables you've used and you've built a model to predict the extent of charitable contributions. Now you're trying to say, well, or should I not, should I include some other additional variable that will improve the quality of my model? Okay, so they want to, the analyst wants to add more variables to improve the model quality. Now what the analyst does is, the analyst looks and finds that a few tall people in our data have made large contributions. Right, so in addition to income, family size and zip code, we happen to have information on people's heights and we have found that there are a few tall people who have made handsome contributions, handsome charitable contributions. So the question is, should we include height as another predictor variable? Because there are two or three tall people and they have made good charitable contributions. So if you include height, then the predictive ability of uh, your model on the training data would improve. But should we include this? Well, clearly, from our understanding, you know, this is noise. It's just coincidence that some tall people have made lots of contributions. And we have no reason to believe that tall people are more charitable than short people. Right. So clearly, even though adding height provides your model with a good fit, we don't want to do this because what we are really trying to do in this case, if we include height is we are simply matching the noise 
rather than the actual underlying patterns. Okay. Now, of course, this example might seem highly contrived, and it is highly contrived, uh, an example of overfitting. But many times what happens is people have large data sets with many different variables, and they may simply just try all kinds of combinations and stick with the combination that seems to work best. Okay. When they do that somewhat blindly, because there are too many variables, they cannot possibly explain every single variable. So they just simply use as many as they can. When they arrive at a model that works, they just go and use it. Right. So when you do things unthinkingly like that, you will end up in, in uh, counterintuitive or illogical things like this. Right. So this is clearly, clearly an example of overfitting. So clearly, the more variables we include in our model, the greater risk we run of overfitting the model. Right? So it's possible that just by throwing in a lot of variables, you get good predictive variability, but you might be overfitting your training data. So now moving on to another topic, many times what you will find in data is there are some outliers in the data. So for example, you may have people's heights and you're using these heights in certain kinds of analyses and suddenly you find that there are a couple of people out there who are eight feet tall okay very tall and you know that these are outliers similarly uh, let's say you've got incomes of several people in a in a neighborhood and you've got most of the people earning between let's say thirty thousand and one hundred and fifty thousand, and then you've got uh, four or five people out of ten thousand who are earning a couple of million bucks or you know tens of millions or hundreds of million dollars Okay, so these are all outliers and we typically don't want to include outliers in our data because in many of the techniques they tend to distort the results. A common example is, uh, let's say there are 10 people sitting and having, uh, you know, having a drink at a bar and their average income is, uh, let's say, $50,000, right? That's the average income. Now, in walks Bill Gates into the bar as the 11th guy. And suddenly the average income just shot through the roof. Okay, but you know the, the the composition of the group has not really changed much. So what happens is that the effect of this one value so completely dwarfs the effects of all the remaining values. That is the problem with outliers. Okay, so you want to try and get rid of outliers. So an important thing that you want to do is when you're looking at exploratory data analysis when you're looking initially at the data you want to clean it get rid of the outliers and then start your analysis because if you include the outliers in your analysis it tends to distort things okay so there are some rules of thumb for identifying outliers and of course this is you know when you say something is an outlier it is inherently a subjective decision there's nothing objective that says this is an outlier but there are several tested rules of thumb and the packages that we are using will automatically identify outliers. So it's not a problem that we have to sit down and do the analysis. The package can do it. Or you could use your own rules of thumb to identify outliers. For example, you may say any value which is outside the three sigma range, I'm going to drop. And we'll talk about that also later. Uh, so you might, you know, just in order to try and identify outliers, you may sort the data, look at the max, the min, look at how they are distributed, you can look at where they are clustered and so on, right? But of course, as I've already said, there's always the ambiguity issue of what is really an outlier. It's subjective. You just have to decide and subjectively determine that some things are outliers. Okay, how do you treat outliers? First of all, before determining that something is an outlier, you want to try and explain it. So it is possible that something looks like an outlier, but it's really a valid piece of information that has something meaningful to contribute to the model. It's possible. Okay, so you want to really be sure that including it is going to harm the model or alternately, it's possible that some of the data are outliers because they're downright wrong. Somebody made a mistake in data entry, so you've got an outlandish piece of data. So for example, somebody's height is marked as 15 feet. Well, clearly that cannot be the case. So you know, maybe it was some particular value, somebody mistyped it, uh, whatever, right? So that way it's possible. So if it's something obviously wrong that you can make out, then you can treat it as an outlier and drop it. Otherwise, you want to try and explain it, and sometimes it could be valid, in which case you accept it. Whatever it is, 
you have to carefully look at the data to identify and eliminate outliers. Okay, another problem with data is missing values. So in this example, I've colored all the missing values. So you've got many rows which have all the attributes. So for example, the first row has values for all the attributes, assuming these dash dot dot dots are real values, which I have not provided uh, actual values for, but they're there. So the first row has all the values. The second row has all the values. In the third row, we're missing assets. Fourth row is missing age, income, education, and so on. Right. So what do you do with these missing values? Because when you apply a model, the model will require all the values to be present. Okay. If some values are not present, then the model won't be able to really use that particular case in any meaningful way. So that's a problem. Missing values is a problem. How do you deal with missing values? Well, one thing you could do is to simply remove the rows. Right. That is, you're saying if a particular row has even one value of an attribute that is missing, let's get rid of it. Okay. Now that's possible. Sometimes you have so much data that you have the luxury of simply throwing away data with, which has missing values. Okay. But sometimes that may not be an option because if you remove those rows, you might be missing a lot of useful information. Right. Especially when you've got when you've got a situation of rare cases, as we discussed earlier, and the rare cases are already rare. And if some attributes are missing and you throw it away, you're losing really valuable information. So you may not always be in a position to remove the rows. If you cannot remove the rows, then one thing you could do is to impute a value to that field. So for example, here, let's say age is missing for this person. Well, in that case, what you could do is to simply put the average age in that position. Right? Sometimes this works because what it does is it, it helps you to save the values of the other attributes. So, for example, take this case of uh, th this particular row here with 29 as the age. Okay, One attribute is missing height. But if because of that, if you throw away that entire row, you're losing valuable information about the age, about unemployed, the status, income, etc., etc. There are lots of other attributes for which you have useful information, which can help your model to identify underlying trends. If you throw it away, you're losing a lot of that. Okay. So rather, what you might try and do is to salvage it by putting an imputed value there. You want to put an imputed value that adds no information, but it helps to preserve other information which is already there okay so the choice is either to remove the rows which may not always be possible but you could impute a value carefully so that it adds no information new new no new information but it preserves data from other columns okay now of course if you have individual cases with too many missing values i shouldn't have said individual variables individual uh, well you could could be individual variables with many missing values so what we are saying there is for example, uh, suppose you've got a variable like uh, gender, okay, and lots of values are missing for gender, okay, or zip code, and lots of values are missing for zip code. That's what we mean by an individual variable with lots of missing values. <coughs> In that case, if it's not an important predictor, you can drop it, okay, but if it is an important predictor, then, but lots of values are missing. Sometimes what you might be able to do is to consider a proxy variable, which is similar to this variable, not exactly the same, right? Something that is closely related, but it doesn't have as many missing values, right? So you might say, well, ideally, I'd love to have this column because this column is a really good predictor. Fine, but unfortunately, there are missing values. What do you do? unless you can go and gather more information, those are missing values. So even though this is a fantastic predictor, if it's got missing values, it can't be a good predictor. So what you might do is to settle for a different proxy variable, a variable that is very similar to this, that can stand in for this, and has somewhat less predicting predictive power, but it can work. Okay, So it's worth considering a proxy which has fewer missing values. Or alternately, 
you might consider investing more time and effort to get more data. If it's that important and you don't have a good proxy, unfortunately, you have to put in the work, the time, effort and money to get the job done, collect more data. Okay, so that's an uh, important aspect as well. Now here, we want to uh, address yet another very important aspect of data mining in general statistical analysis. Okay, so here we've got two very small data sets. You've got age and income, right? In the first one, age 21 is income is 27,000, age 30, 32,000, 23, 8,000. Uh, in the second one, the incomes are same, but the ages are different. 26 is 27,000, 21 is 32,000, and 45 is 8,000. So if you look at it and say, well, are these two data sets pretty similar? We would probably say, no, they're pretty different. Because in the first one, uh, the uh, income seems to be rising. I mean, the income seems to be rising with age. At least there's some kind of a pattern. In the second one, it's very different. Right? The income doesn't seem to have uh, any pattern with age. Right? So these two data sets actually look very, very, very different if you look at it carefully. But what happens is in many quantitative techniques, we use the measure of distance between points as a measure of similarity and dissimilarity. Okay? So for example, here are the two data sets and we calculate the distance between the various points, right? So for the first table on the top left, on the bottom of that, right below that, we show the distance. So you've got the three cases numbered A, B, and C. The distance between A and B is 5,000. Distance between B and C is 24,000. And between A and C is 19,000. Okay. In the second example, the distances are almost identical. A, B is 5,000. B, C is 24,000 and AC is 19,000, okay? The distance are, are very close. They're different, but not perceptibly different, right? So what happens is in techniques that rely on computing the distance between points as a measure of dissimilarity, to those techniques, these two fairly different data sets would actually not look very similar, uh, not look very different, okay? Now, where is the problem coming from? Well, the problem is coming from the fact that when you compute the distance, right, you're taking age one minus age two, the whole square, income one minus income two, the whole square, sum of those two, and then you're taking the square root, right? So the two terms are squared of square of the difference in age plus the square of the difference in income, right? Here you notice that the incomes are much larger numbers. Age is 21, 30, 23. Incomes are 27,000, 32,000, 8,000. So even differences like the difference between 27,000 and 32,000 is so large that it can dwarf the difference in age between 20, 21 and 45, for example. Okay. So this, the point is that income, because the absolute numbers are so large, that is dwarfing the effect of any differences that occur in age. Okay, so in some sense, income is hijacking everything in this particular example. Okay, but suppose we replace these incomes with much smaller numbers. In other words, you change the income to income in thousands of dollars. So age 21, income is now, instead of 27,000, is 2.7 and so on. Right, so when you scale down the income, effectively, the data sets are not different from what they were earlier. Instead of measuring income in, in dollars, we are now measuring it in thousands of dollars. However, now if you look at the distance, they're drastically different. Because now the differences in age are starting to play a role in this whole process. Okay? So we don't, we don't want arbitrary things like these to affect our data analysis. But if we did the analysis like this in techniques that use distance, then we would run into these kinds of problems, right? So what is the solution? The solution is usually to normalize or scale the values. Okay, let's see an example here. Uh, we've got incomes, which are shown here on the left-hand side, which is 38,000, 25,000, 47,000, etc. The scaled values would look like what are shown on the right-hand side. Shortly, we'll discuss how exactly the scaling process is carried out. But what you can see is the largest income is 56,000, 
680 and the corresponding scale value of that is 1.406 the smallest income is 25162 and the scaled value for that is minus 2.221 okay so the relative ordering is preserved and uh, the maximum is still the maximum the minimum is still the minimum so it's all done but the values are now scaled values right so now incomes all the incomes are small numbers and uh, the scaled income cannot really hijack any distance calculations of course uh, if it's so small and some other variables are there which are not scaled they could hijack your distance calculation so we have to be careful how did we do the scaling well the way we did the scaling was we took the original data we calculated the mean and the standard deviation again these are concepts which i'm sure you're already familiar with but we'll also discuss them again in the next lecture next week so we calculate the mean and standard deviation and what we really try and do what we do is for every value for example i've shown the calculation for 55,349. For every value, you take the value, subtract the mean, divided by the standard deviation, right? So value minus mean divided by the standard deviation. And that is your scaled value. And that is how all of these scaled values have been computed. So to clarify, what we are saying is the original value is x. The scaled value is x minus mu divided by sigma, where mu is the average or the mean and sigma is the standard deviation so effectively what we're saying is we're calculating for every value how many standard deviations is it away from the mean values less than average will be negative scale values values greater than average will be positive scale values equal to average will be scaled to zero okay so that's really what's going on with normalization and scaling it's not always needed so we have to apply our judgment as to when to apply scaling 